everybody. My name is Alexey Krabrov and this is the second episode of our Scaled podcast and series where we explore scaled companies, people and software. And we're very fortunate to be here at D2IQ with Ben Hinman, who is the co-founder of D2IQ and the creator of Mesos. Uh, Apache Mesos is an orchestration framework. And first I'll ask Ben, what is Mesos? What's Mesos? Well, um, Mesos is a piece of software that we built, wow, we started back in 2009, so it's been quite some time now. Um, and we built it to make it easier for people to build and run their own distributed systems. Um, at 2009, the challenges that we were seeing were people were having difficulty trying to either scale up things like Hadoop or build their own versions of, of Hadoop, build their own new distributed systems. Uh, and from our perspective, we felt like building an, a distributed system should be as easy as writing a piece of software for a single machine. Mm -hmm. um, and really, we just needed more software to, to make that easier. So uh, we effectively created this resource management platform. That's what Mesos is. Um, and, uh, and made it so you could build all sorts of other things on top. Probably the most famous of them that we built on top was Apache Spark. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, which was, has been a very wildly successful. Uh, which, as I remember, was a toy application. Yeah, that's exact, exactly right, yeah. When we first built it, uh, we were just trying to prove the fact that you could build these distributed systems easily. I think the first version of Spark was maybe only a thousand lines of code. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and you could do a lot, and that was really, really speaking to the power of being able to leverage something like Mesos for, 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 for building and, and running distributed systems. So a lot of folks now take you know, clusters and services for granted, right? So the whole cloud phenomena uh, appeared after that, shortly after that, or in parallel. So can you bring us back a little bit to the motivation? What is it where you're scaling, Yeah. right? What was the pain point which was hard to scale? Yeah. Well, so um, it was very, it's, it's, it's a, Multifaceted answer, really. So first, I think the hard part was, from a very technical perspective, there's no, there was no way of being able to write software where you could just get resources from somewhere in the cluster. Mm -hmm. We just, we didn't write software that way. Um, we have that today, but it's still pretty, pretty coarse grained. I'll, I'll talk about that in, in, in just a second. But the analogy I like to use is. When people write software on their, their laptops or for you know, a server machine or for their phones and they want to do more computation, they fork a process or they create a thread. Mm -hmm. If they want to do more things, they allocate memory. Mm -hmm. That's just what they do. That's just what you write as, as a programmer. You do these things to get these resources and then you can do your computation. Mm -hmm. um, the way that it worked in 2009, if you wanted to do more things in on a distributed system, is you you know went to another human and you said, "Can you allocate me another machine?" Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then with that other machine, I'll run this other application or I'll run another version of my application, and so forth and so on. Um, and I, to me, that 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 was sort of that was sort of the fundamental the fundamental issue. You know, the, the fundamental challenge in scaling distributed systems was. There wasn't this natural, it was an impedance mismatch between writing the software as a programmer and then running that software in, in the, the, the cluster. And, and sure, we had frameworks at the time that were being developed like Hadoop, um, but they were specific for data science. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, you know, they were specific for doing analytics. They were specific for doing big data. Mm -hmm. um, and, and really, you know, the holy grail, I think, is that you have a you know a programming model which naturally captures this distributed setting, and that's what we really set out to do with Mesos. Um, so that that was that was kind of you know the fundamental limit from a programmer perspective of, of of trying to to scale you know building new, new new distributed distributed systems. What was really interesting from our perspective was while we the way that we approached the problem was. Let's make it so more people can build distributed systems. Mm -hmm. um, as I think often happens with, with technology, uh, you, know, you, you build something with a particular problem in mind, and there's a different problem that ends up being the thing that most people end up using the, 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 the software for. Um, our, ours wasn't necessarily a different problem, but it was 
it, it was that whole issue that I talked about where you have to go to a human to get a machine. Mm -hmm. um, that was where everybody really focused on the resource management you know, craze. So mm -hmm. lots of different projects came out that was really sort of trying to solve that particular problem um, and just make it so you didn't have to go to a human to get more machines to run things. Mm -hmm. But less of this programming model thing. You know, it was, it was still, it was, it was, it was less of people writing code where they could just get some resources from somewhere in the cluster and then they could run their computations and more just like, hey, run five of these, but I don't want to go talk to a machine, so mm -hmm. some code's going to figure that out, but not the code itself is the thing that's requesting the five machines. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, so uh, and, and that sort of, you know, I think that was really what kicked off this whole container orchestration phase is you had this strong desire by developers and, and, and operators alike to, to make it so that developers could very easily get resources and run some of their applications on it, but not from a programming language, mm -hmm. from, from, uh, from, from you know, an API call. Um, and of course, everything in computer science is a little bit blurry because the minute that you're making an API call, like, isn't it kind of like you're programming? Yes, <laughs> yes. It's like, where is your own time, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes, so, so uh, would you say this was kind of the, in line with the DevOps movement, make developer run operations through software? That's exactly right. And so this is cattle, not pets it's paradigm, exactly right? right? So yeah. you, you don't want to know the names of this machine. So what, what's the typical use case? So what are the resources, right? So we have, uh, typically we have memory, we have disk, right? We have faster CPU. Uh, is this the class of resources mostly? Allocated? Yeah, I, I mean, I think what's what's really interesting is that the, in the early days, um, we actually spent a lot of time thinking about how we could expose all of these resources, um, in particular, disk, mm -hmm. um, uh, and 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 really, there was such a, a benefit that I think people saw from even just. CPU and memory, nothing else. Mm -hmm. I mean, to be perfectly honest, there was such a benefit in having some layer that could just run these applications instead of a human mm -hmm. um, that some people just didn't even care how many resources were being consumed. Mm -hmm. uh, in a lot of cases, machines were so underutilized that any system, you know, resource manager like Mesos or resource manager like Kubernetes or any of these systems, even if they just didn't do a great job of running multiple applications on a single machine, there was tended to be plenty of resources on those machines um, that people didn't, like they weren't even specifying necessarily the right amount of resources that they needed to run their applications. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the resources would just be consumed by the apps and everything worked. Now, as people started to push the limits harder and harder, they cared a lot about how many resources were actually being consumed by which apps. Um, and we started to do some really interesting things when it came to things like oversubscription mm -hmm. and uh, you know learning what was actually the right you know allocation for the individual applications. Um, there's a lot that happened happened over the years. Um, and storage, I still think, is one of those ones that will grow over time. We focused on it really early because the most difficult distributed systems to run are the ones with state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so, so it, from the early days, we really wanted to figure out uh, what primitives we would need to build to make it easier to actually run stateful distributed systems. And so obviously, figuring out what your storage resources look like and how they can be allocated and how they can be split and shared and all these things was, was really important for us. Um, it continues to be important for, for all the work that we do. It's funny, there. Larry, because now this whole serverless revolution came to the point of stateful serverless. That's exactly and right. They discover state, and so now it's, right, how do you do that? Yeah, yeah, no, that's exactly right. Um, and when you, you know, when you described uh, basically the kind of the golden early days of, of uh, Mesos, yeah. I just realized this is basically like your little private cloud. Yeah. Like, you basically, people, like, you know, if you give people free Amazon, They'll just spin up a bunch of stuff, yeah. right? Like, why should they care? They just spin up a bunch of instances. It's their corporate data center, and they don't need to pay for it. They'll yeah. just so you, you can just do a good job by spinning up all the machines and yeah. just putting them somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, 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 again, I, I think with the cloud and the ability to hit an API endpoint that gives me a new VM or gives me a new container, um, I think we're getting closer to 
this realization of being able to truly program the cloud, but I still think we're not there yet. I still think yes. that, you know, I think we'll be there when people build software, they build applications where when they want to do some other computation, just like they would have, you know, allocated memory or forked a process or, or uh, spawned a thread mm -hmm. on their single machine to do that computation, they can do the same thing, but now it just runs somewhere, anywhere in the cloud. I think that will be true cloud programming. I, I know for sure that programming the cloud cannot be based on much of YAML. Yeah, that's I've exactly seen it, right? right. Like this is, you know, I, I still don't understand, you know, the progress is not linear because yeah. this seems like a regress to me. Uh, so, but you know, let me kind of dig a little bit into the history because I think w what I'd like to understand um, in this series is really we have some inflection points and some things. Uh, first of all, they scale other companies mm -hmm. and the things themselves are scalable. Where is the metric of scale? I want to understand this a little bit. So, so you were doing this research at Berkeley, right? And, and th so that was the research project uh, at Amplab, mm -hmm. yep, yep. right? And, and, and so can you talk a little bit about the origin of this project? And then you brought it to Twitter. Yep. And how did it uh, catch fire? Yeah. What made it, right? Because it's, I think people had to go on a limb. And so I think I'm really interested, like what, like some magic happened there. Yeah, yeah. Well, so so the origin, the origin actually came um, out of parallel computing. So mm -hmm. um, uh, we were doing a lot of research in, in parallel computing and, and specifically new parallel computing models uh, that let you more dynamically move resources around in these these ap applications. Mm -hmm. um, we had these really powerful. 128 or 256 core chips mm -hmm. <laughs> that we wanted to m much more efficiently run, run with a single application. And what we noticed, uh, a collaboration between myself and, and a couple of, of, of other folks that were doing a lot of Hadoop work, was there were a lot of these similar ideas of trying to scale Hadoop on distributed systems. Um, in fact, in some cases, I had more CPU cores on those 256 <laughs> core boards than we had in our clusters of Hadoop. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, so the, that was really the origins. And again, you know, everything I was discussing earlier about you know, the goal of kind of creating this truly pro pro programmable cloud or programmable uh, 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 distributed system was the goal. And then Twitter, uh, amongst many other big, big, big companies, started to pick it up because they saw, as you pointed out earlier, this, this DevOps thing happening mm -hmm. and this opportunity less to get people so much to program distributed systems and more to simplify it so that people didn't have to go and talk to humans to get, to get, to get their applications actually launched in, in, in the cluster. Mm -hmm. um, and it had a lot of benefits of by doing it through an API like this, these companies like Twitter and a bunch of other organizations, they could abstract themselves away from any particular cloud or any particular virtual machine-based system, whether they were using OpenStack or VMware or any of the clouds, they could kind of abstract themselves away from all that and just say, all right, here's an interface where, where you know, developers can show up and they can be responsible for operating you know, DevOps, their, their, their own applications. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, that, that was sort of, it, that was, you know, you talk about sort of inflection points mm -hmm. in the industry there was a very, that was very ripe. That was a very ripe, ripe mm -hmm. opportunity for, you know, or people had been doing a lot of Puppet. Yes. Um, they'd been doing a lot of Chef. That's right. Um, they'd been doing a lot of these, these other, other tools, which are all great, great tools that sort of helped us in this progression of, you know, where we'll ultimately get to as, as, a, as, a, as an industry. Um, but I think, still think it was a lot of work. You know, you talk about people writing YAMLs is not the, the right strategy. Well, the stuff you had to write in the chef world or the stuff you had to write in the puppet world and then still the interactions you had to have with humans to do all that yes. was still just too much. I did that. I remember that. It was basically a bunch of bespoke Ruby, which included other Ruby. Mm -hmm. And so everybody had their own idiosyncratic representation of the system. Yeah. But the ground was laid by you know, infrastructure as code. Exactly. Right started to appear. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, that, 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 that the ground was laid there, and then I think people were very, very excited about this opportunity of going one step farther beyond the chef puppet worlds to something even more automated. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really the opportunity that we had with, with uh, 
Mesos at places like Twitter, you know, and then a bunch of other organizations started using it. Netflix, Apple, <laughs> Uber, um, you know, a bunch of these big organizations um, that I think it was also a, a good time because there were a lot of engineers there that weren't excited about the chefs and the puppets, yes. you know? They felt yes. like there's got to be a better way, and they had such massive scale mm -hmm. compared to a lot of the organizations that were doing chef and puppet, and it was just fine, mm -hmm. um, that they were looking for something else that could really, really help them scale, and that's, that's exactly what uh, Mesos could, could help them with. Um, now, again, uh, people weren't using Mesos with that original intention of programming their own distributed systems, you know, really, you know, for this data center. Um, they were using Mesos basically just to launch, you know, N to M instances, possibly dynamically, but mm -hmm. just you know, some, some number of instances of their applications. Right. Can you uh, kind of remember what uh, was instrumental in having Mesos adopted at Twitter, right? So, because here's, you know, PhD candidate at Berkeley, right, coming into Twitter, and here is a bunch of overworked guys who essentially need stuff running, yeah. right? Need stuff up, yeah. and 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 obviously this is there is this new thing. Yeah. So I think it's pretty magical that you know, and they obviously so they have their own data center, yeah. and they're having some patchwork of scripts, yep. keeping yep. it up, right? Yep. So so who took the risk? How, how did this actually materialize? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I I think one of the things to me that made um, you know my experience at Twitter so memorable. Uh, was there was a very real need, um, and at the end of the day, as we all know, a lot of things only happen in industry when there's some real value <laughs> that, that's associated with it, as well as I think there was this intellectual curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's the thing that, I, that, to me, made the time at Twitter so special. Is it wasn't like we just went in there because there was like some need and we did it. There was also this intellectual curiosity of, hey, can we here at Twitter introduce a, a new novel way of getting people to actually launch their applications. But the need was they had Puppet mm -hmm. um, and a lot of it, and people were effectively having to map mm -hmm. which machines ran which services. Mm -hmm. There was some Excel spreadsheet or spreadsheet that was capturing <laughs> all this stuff. It was, it was chaos. It was, it, it, was, it was nuts. I mean, it wasn't chaos. It was state of the art, mm -hmm. but it was state of the so art. So the service then. discovery was Excel spreadsheet. So service discovery was, yeah, <laughs> let's figure out what IPs you're actually going to talk. And, and what happened during that time at Twitter, which was so fun and, and, and such a memorable part to, to be a part of, was this whole idea of like, all right, let's, let's decouple all this stuff. Let's do service discovery where applications can actually just say, hey, where is blah, blah, blah service, and then I can talk to that. Kind of sounds like DNS, yes, but something at massive scale and potentially changing even faster, being even more dynamic than something like, like DNS. Mm -hmm. um, we used Zookeeper, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and we built a bunch of software around that. So things like that were evolving. Other really fun things that were evolving were um, uh, uh, decoupling services into smaller and smaller parts. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a natural thing as companies get bigger is they can't have 100 people all working on the same application. Yes. It's just natural that that happens. We actually used to talk about it at Twitter as, um, as SOA, as software-oriented architecture, just without the message bus because mm -hmm. we use Zookeeper and some kind of service discovery mechanism. Mm -hmm to figure out where other people were and then did point-to-point -point communication with, with all, each of the, those, those different services versus, say, the SOA days where you stuck something on the message bus and mm -hmm. then everyone listened on the message bus. Um, it wasn't until uh, more companies started to think about that and we're doing that as well and more people talked about it that that term microservice really came out, mm -hmm. which is sort of what we were doing. We were creating yes. all these old services, yes. service-oriented architecture, and they were real small, and then and then then microservice became. Yes, thing. micro was not the new era in services. It's just a different yeah. name for yeah. services. Yeah. But you know, you you talk about scaled, and again, inflection points. The inflection point for an organization like Twitter was they couldn't scale the engineering organization mm -hmm. unless they thought about different technical architectures for what they wanted to do, and it was really a perfect storm. If you choose to break up your software into many different pieces, then 
you either need a lot more humans to manage running all those different pieces, or you need some software to help manage running all those pieces. And that's really what Mesos was at Twitter. Yes. So it was a good storm. The company was scaling. We were changing the architecture to deal with that scale. Um, and, uh, and Mesos was able to come in and, and, and really help. So I wonder kind of in terms of who kind of was your uh, champions. Mm -hmm. So the first time I heard about Mesosforce from Myris Erickson, mm -hmm. who uh, advised uh, kind of informally uh, my startup, Versal, we invited him because we did Scala, and he was well known yep. in the Scala world with Finagle. Yep. And, and he actually mentioned Mesos to me. So in 2012, it sounded like a revelation. Mm. He just told me like, you know, you just launch all these machines. Mm -hmm. And so to me, I really needed from this point on, he says, there's this guy, Ben Hitman. <laughs> he's not really like talking to a bunch of companies, you know, like I am going around, like he's a Twitter. So from that point on, you guys were on my radar. Mm. And at that point, I remember vividly, it sounded like magic because we did salt stack, which was a <laughs> Python version <laughs> of Puppet and Chef, which was a bunch of crap. Yeah. So for whatever reason, there is something, not a bunch of crap people use for hundreds of thousands of machines. Totally, but yeah. not in the same league, yeah. right? So, so Marius was the clear champion of Mesos. He just, you know, he talked about it as, as a given. It's mm. like it's something Twitter uses. So were engineers like Marius your champions inside? Yeah. Yeah. Or was it, and like, how did they get buy-in from the VPs? Or totally. like, what, what was the process there? Yeah, well, so, so, so first, one of the things you just mentioned that I, I just feel like I have, to, I have to repeat, there's a great quote, and I don't remember it, but something is, uh, um, you know, every, every good piece of technology has a little bit of magic, <laughs> right? like, or something like that. Like, I always feel like when I see some technology, I'm like, oh, how did, how, did how did that work? It's always a little, a little magical. It's always fun. Yeah, so, uh, I th again, I, I think there was a perfect storm at, at, at Twitter. Um, in, in our case, um, we had some strong engineers like Marius and a bunch of other people like that that were advocates of us actually trying to do this. Mm -hmm. um, but then in addition to that, um, I actually, when I first got to Twitter, I worked with the chief scientist there, um, a guy named Abder Chowdhury. Mm -hmm. um, and Abder had actually come into Twitter through uh, an acquisition of his, his company doing search. Mm -hmm. um, and he was kind of tasked with you know, bringing in I think people like myself to think about how we can do some smarter things inside Twitter mm -hmm. across the whole spectrum, nice. across data science, across anal uh, analytics, across infrastructure as well. Um, and so myself and a couple other people basically on his team kind of had this charter to go and see what we could do from an infrastructure perspective. Um, and so combined with him, uh, and engineers, engineers like Marius, there was a lot of support for us to actually try to make this happen. Uh, and then I think as we made progress and we started to actually move real applications onto the platform, more and more engineers within the company just kind of were clamoring, hey, we want to do this too. We want to make our lives easier too. We want to take advantage of this too, so forth and so on. So eventually we had a bunch of people in internally that were interested in, in, in doing it. Not everybody, you know, some people still, you know, we're just happy with doing it the old, old fashioned way and, mm -hmm. and that's fine. And so we did at some point, um, there was a, a mandate at some point that everybody had to actually move and do it in, in, in this way. But, um, uh, but, but, uh, but we had plenty of people that wanted to take advantage of the tech. So again, I think we were really fortunate. Um, uh, and, and again, Twitter was scaling and that helped tremendously to getting people that were thinking about what could we do to actually help, help the company scale even faster. It was a really fun time. I know you came around Twitter at that time a lot. Yes. And there was a bunch of great tech was being built. You, know, yes. you, you mentioned Finagle and, um, and there was a bunch of other really, really fun technology that I thought was, was getting developed at the company. And being open source, I thought mm -hmm. Twitter was, um, was a, a, you know, a good you know, icon at the time for being strong supporters of open source and getting people to Finagle was even its own GitHub org, right? So basically, like dog fooding your own open source, yep. from using it in production. To me, that was yep. very impressive. Yeah, it was. It was. It was really fun. So this, I mean, this is great insight that if you have, you know, a chief scientist who is uh, motivated to bring this, you know, uh, operations solution, right? I think this is really, this is a very interesting to me. A hundred percent. You know, I, I, you know, when I think back on the all the ingredients that were necessary for some of this stuff to happen. Um, I think that that was a critical one, you know, to have that champion 
Uh, and not just for him to be a champion, but also for him to have you know, the, the direction kind of given to him of like, hey, what, what kind of things can we do? I think there's a lot of organizations that have R&D organizations. Um, and I think that actually there was some really, really good stuff that, that came out of this one. And some of them are just kind of almost, they just exist, and I think this one actually produced a ton of good stuff. You know, now it strikes me, this is very interesting, because I, you know, work with Twitter uh, on committee stewardship. We do, you know, subscale meetups there. Uh, it used to host Scale by the Bay. It's been a, a major sponsor this year. And so my goal with Zero was always to bring together end-to-end -to -end demonstrations of technology, mm -hmm. right? And I always wanted to see, you know, like they do in the life of a tweet, how it passes through the system from API of the user to the internal systems and, and then passes through all this and some ads are run and, you know, and Jack's is money growing on some bar charts, right? So basically this is, this is what, what I always wanted to do and it was very hard yeah. because it seemed pretty silent and I, I basically thought this is the just, just necessary feature of a company growing that you know, everybody becomes specialized and finagle people are finagle people, machine learning is here mm -hmm. and database is here Manhattan, and so, so what, what you describe is cross-sectional, and I did not see it myself mm. at this scale. So mm -hmm. I wonder if this is, uh, it was easier because the company was smaller and more mm. fluid, mm. and they did a lot of transitions. Mm -hmm. And so I think, like, from, from what you describe, I think it's very important mm -hmm. to keep this spirit mm -hmm. and dynamic alive, right? That, that the more you grow, I noticed, like, people just become settled in their jobs, yeah. right? And so in the way they, 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 it's very important to think of, uh, it's probably hard, much harder to bring uh, like a massive change like this to a bigger company. Yeah. So that I think that's also probably a good point in, in life. It died right? totally when they switched yeah. from Ruby to Scala. Yeah. So yeah. they caught the, the right moment. Yeah. Yeah. So I wonder now, kind of, I, I'd like to take that. And so, you know, you took this uh, framework, which succeeded in scaling Twitter, mm. right? And you took it into the wild. And yeah. so was the idea that now you will scale the world. Right, yeah. you will scale others. Yeah, you will bring this. Yep. So I wonder now how this works out. Right, rubber hits the road. Yeah. So, uh, so this is a, a little bit different. So, so you kind of you 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 saw this work, and I remember um, Flo did this at Airbnb, and they did Kronos, mm -hmm. right? And so they implemented, as I remember, kind of indestructible bash, mm -hmm. right? Running yeah. running exactly. jobs for yep. Airbnb, and yep. I think that really. Uh, worked out, right, because they did this graph of jobs. And yeah. so as I, I went to a tech talk at Airbnb and I saw them presenting and like, I think they said they, they trained civilians <laughs> to run uh, uh, jobs yep. on Kronos, yep. right? So was that a first kind of proof of concept that you, this can be done outside? Yeah, well, so yeah, so um, so, so Flo, my, my co-founder here at uh, D2IQ, he so he, he was at Airbnb at the time, and you're exactly right, he built, he built Kronos. So what was Kronos? So Flo used to, uh, he'd get into the office on Monday, and he'd find out that all these batch computations that they'd been running since last week had failed over the weekend. Mm -hmm. You know, failed on Sunday or failed Monday early, whatever it was. And he'd have to go and he'd have to, you know, figure out, you know, which machine was down, and then come and get the batch thing back up and running and get everything going, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes that'd take him a couple days, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, then he'd get it up and running, and then Thursday he'd be like, geez, okay, my week's over, that was <laughs> exhausting. And then he'd start all over again on Monday when something failed. So he basically proposed to me, he said, hey, you know, um, you've got this thing, Mesos, I want to build a distributed system uh, that's going to run a bunch of other things so that when stuff fails, I want to have that API of just being able to say, just give me some more resources and I'll run it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it was a different programming model than, say, Hadoop. Again, there were you know, distributed systems out there, but it yes. was a vastly different programming model. It was a DAG, just as you said. It was yes. a graph, a, a, a directed graph. Um, and so he needed to kind of create this system for letting people express their DAGs and then, and then go run it. And that was Kronos. And it was hugely popular. It was one of those funny things where um, I even remember when, when he was building it, I don't know that he, he being Flo, even really thought how valuable or popular it was going to be. I think he was just trying to solve a problem. Yes. <laughs> um, he was just trying to build some tech and solve a problem. Um, and then all, all of a sudden we started to hear all these people that were like, oh, I have that exact need. Mm -hmm. You know, I have that exact need of being able to run this DAG of things that have to get launched. 
and I've hacked up all these scripts to try to figure it out and deal with dependencies and blah, blah, blah. Um, and this is perfect. I can just do it. Now, at the same time, the other part that I thought was so, was uh, at that time, an interesting aspect that I think is really relevant is there were commercial pieces of software that did this. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm forgetting s some of the names of them right now, but there were a couple of, of things that we would show up mm -hmm. and they'd be like, oh yeah, we've bought IBM blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it does exactly this thing for us. And then these people would be like, wait, yours is 100% open source free thing. I can just download and run it. You know, I'm spending all this money to big company. So, um, so I think that was kind of one of the really interesting aspects to me was uh, this was before I really became an entrepreneur, but I, you know, there was this moment of thinking like, whoa, 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 you know, people need this and there's already a product out there that's not as scalable or, you know, has as many features or, or something else. Perhaps, perhaps, you know, there's an opportunity here for something to go get built. Uh, but, but yeah, that was one of the first companies we started working with outside of Twitter. Um, and then, you know, again, you talk about scale. There was a little period of time where I gave a lot of talks and did a lot of meetups and uh, had to sort of scale myself <laughs> uh, to, to really meet with a bunch of companies to talk about what we were doing. Um, and I, I still think that that's a, a, a pretty important part of all, you know, scaling all, all tech projects is you, you sort of do have to go pound the pavement and, and, and chat with people. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it depends really on the project, but especially if you're trying to do something that's a little bit different, uh, that is in the face a little bit of how people have been doing it and has the risk of totally and completely failing <laughs> um, and, and not being successful, I, I think that that, that you know, it really requires you to go out and, and you know, and preach the good word, you know, and mm -hmm. get people excited about tr trying it for themselves. So um, that was kind of the other thing that happened to really get it out outside of, of Twitter. And again, I think Twitter did a great job. We hosted a ton of meetups at Twitter to talk about what we were doing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we wrote some blog posts from, from Twitter. We did a bunch of those kinds of things to, to help help get it get it out there. Um, and, uh, and, and it was, you know, wildly successful, as I mentioned. There was a bunch of organizations that were able to take it and and, and even to this day, run it on millions of machines. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, this is very interesting to me, right? So basically, so again, I think there is some magic going on here because there is this open source uh, at heart company, Twitter, right? And now there is Airbnb with, first of all, a really valid business. So the result of data is coming in, jobs are run, but it's not, it's not a software company per se, right? It's, it's, it's a resource management in real estate. It's in a kind of weird way similar totally. to, to messes, but with buildings, yeah. right? And people. And, and so <laughs> they, they just have the need to run stuff. And by virtue of this economy where people move around, right? So Flo comes there. He comes with open source background. Obviously, you know, nobody is going to buy a massive commercial offering. Right, people are gonna use what they know, yep. and so so this is interesting to me. And obviously, I think around this time, probably if you would describe messages to a bunch of other engineers, like myself, then uh, they would jump on this. Yeah. Right. So so it's uh, I, you know I wonder one thing, kind of a little bit going to puppet and chef. Can you like I I have a feeling dealing with them that they basically kind of the, they reach the limit of you know, BOFH, kind mm -hmm. of best third operator from hell capability. Yeah. So yeah. basically there is this sysadmin who juggles more and more stuff with his SSH and scripts mm -hmm. and bespoke bash scripts and Ruby, right? And so, so in some way these are the things on steroids which reached the natural ceiling of yeah. manageability. So any engineer who would be present with Mesos, yeah. uh, now Kubernetes, right? That's why I think people jump on Kubernetes. Can you, can you kind of formalize or verbalize what is, if you would have to d kind of separate in hyperspace, Puppet and Chef and Salt Stack and systems like that from Mesos and Kubernetes. What is the key difference between them? Yeah, so um, I mean, the fundamental difference with uh, especially the original designs of the Salt and the Puppets mm -hmm. um, is, the, sorry, the Chefs and the Puppets, is you were, well, let me rewind just a second. How did we manage computers to begin with? Well, first, we didn't have a lot of computers. Most companies, they had a single server. Mm -hmm, <laughs> and, they, and they had all their web 
requests or you know whatever was happening would come to that single server mm -hmm. and they do all their their stuff and it was stateless they were just kind of serving web pages or something, yes. right um, when they started to add more machines because they had more users or whatever it was you know when you have five machines like I can remember five IP addresses yes I can remember the complete IP addresses I can remember five passwords I can remember all that stuff I, I, I can I can just you could call one dog the other cat and so forth. It's exactly you know you make it super simple and then and then you handle it um, I might be able to do 10, you know, maybe I could even do 20, but after 20, I'm probably not going to remember all those things anymore. So what did they do? People started to, to take all this information, the IP address, what operating system was on the machine, what you know, users were allowed to go access the machine, what applications, and what, what did they do? They wrote it down somewhere, mm -hmm. right, because they, they couldn't remember it, so they wrote it down. And, in a spreadsheet, or yes. they wrote it down on a sheet of paper, and like hopefully they didn't write it down on a sheet of paper that they spilled coffee on. Yes. <laughs> then they, uh, you know, didn't have that information anymore. Um, then they started storing it, you know, on actual files, and so forth. So the, the chefs and the puppets, they came into this world of saying, let's take that stuff that people are writing down in an ad hoc way mm -hmm. and formalize it, so that and, and do the automation of when someone writes down on a sheet of paper. This machine should have this operating system mm -hmm. with this, these libraries and running this application. Then some, some software can just do that instead of a human having to go in and do all those steps. Mm -hmm. The stuff the human had written down now, now just gets run. Um, but, and this is the key difference, it's still about a single machine. Yes. The chefs and the puppets of the world were still about setting up that single mach machine and kind of having this perspective of ma this machine-based perspective mm -hmm. versus having the application-based perspective. Mm -hmm. So the application-based perspective is, you know, it's not what runs on this machine. The machines are cattle, just right. as you said earlier. You know, the chef and the puppet model was still a pet. This machine was a pet. This was the manifest that described how that pet operated right. in the Mesos world and now the Kubernetes world. It's a cattle. It's just I separated out these pets, who the machines are, and I just take these applications and dynamically I figure out where I'm going to actually run run yes. run the, uh, the 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 applications. So application mind mindset, application centric mindset. And so, so I wonder if this came from, you know, because you come from from research world where people actively avoid being sysadmins, <laughs> right? So 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 in a way, and and you know, a typical you know puppet or chef user, it's a kind of really you know, glorifies this admin who loves his machines. Because this admin loves his machines. He wants them perfectly configured. He knows them. Yeah. And he, don't, he doesn't want others to mess with them. That's exactly right. right. And engineers don't care about all yeah. this. Yeah. Right? So I think that's, that, that's, I think that's a very good, uh, yeah, that's a good, very good division. You know, it, to me, it's one of the reasons why I also don't think that, um, that uh, uh, VMs, you know, have an infinite life. I mean, they're going to exist for a very long time, and mm -hmm. of course, they were a wonderful addition in, in the you know in the path of, of everything we're doing in computer science. But the sysadmin who loved the VM because mm -hmm. they could finally get their users to stop mucking with the actual physical machine, mm -hmm. and the sysadmins could just give their users a VM and say, "There's your sandbox. Now, don't screw up my machine." Yes, but they weren't really helping the end users because the end users still had a machine they had to deal with, right? right? right. You know, the reason why, why sysadmins existed in the first place was to manage the machine for the people. Now they were still giving a machine to the end users and they still were just screwing it up just as much as they were screwing the machines up to begin with. So, right. you know, I think the real key thing is, I, you know, I don't think people actually should care about the machines. You know, when you're just writing your applications at the end of the day, I think all you should care about is the resources. That's right. Do you have the resources you need to do your computation? If the answer is no. Then the next question is, is are they somewhere available where you could, where, that you could access? You know, and that doesn't have to be. I need to go talk to a human to figure out that those are available. That should just be as simple as like. Yeah. Right. It's like nobody should sanctify some weird Unix paths, which grew out of. Uh, you know, Bell Labs people run out of memory and haven't been in user bill and like forever perpetuating that, uh, we, we don't have to do that. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that, that's I think the phase change ultimately that I'm interested in seeing in, in the industry is this one where we get to a place where, you know, when you build an application and you deploy it, it's just, it, it itself can find its own resources from 
whatever it's allowed to talk to, you know, which could be a cloud, a private cloud, it could be some edge device, whatever it is. You know, if there's resources and mm -hmm. I can run my app, if, if, if some software can run more stuff, fork a thread on mm -hmm. those resources, it should be able to do it. That's the future, I hope. All right, so now uh, we have Mesos in the wild. You have the company, and uh, I remember early days, I, actually, I think I've been at every Mesosphere office. I was in this kind of chapel building. Yep. Uh, yep. Right, and then uh, the spaceship building, and yep. now this uh, actually my former uh, Nitro's office where yep. I run a bunch of meetups, so this is all kind of, like, kind of a big circle. Yep. Uh, right, and so I remember, you know, at some point you guys were basically like, there are different positions, different pitches, right? I think you pivoted as any. Mm -hmm. So I think at some point, so early on I was pitching to Paco, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, to that you guys should do end to end data pipelines because mm -hmm. I came up with this Mac stack with light band and mm -hmm. but you guys are focused on data centers utilization right like so your your target audience you thought were managers of data centers who should really save electricity and fill the machines of the hill mm -hmm. right and i think recently we've i've seen kind of the ai focus mm -hmm. right and and so so can you kind of describe to me uh, how did this uh, evolution uh, appear that now, now you, you, you know the magic of scale. You know mm -hmm. how to scale stuff. Mm -hmm. And so you want to bring it to the world yeah. and see where it hits, who are the customers who have the need. So you need to evolve. It's super complex because you need to evolve the business model. But I, kind of in my mind, the, the magic of scale is driving this. Because you can you know, scale something. And so you need to find something you can scale. Mm -hmm. And I remember you even had uh, uh, a carnival cruise ships as a customer. Mm -hmm. And I think it was like, so here's the cruise ships, it has resources, right? So, so um, how? Uh, how did you find this kind of niches where customers need scaling? How did they realize they need, need to scale? Mm -hmm. How did you convince them that this is the right way to scale? Yeah. How did this thing evolve? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, so I think the early days, um, there, was a, there was always this, this question of uh, should we as a company go and focus on helping people do the resource management in their clusters for I'll call them, you know, the web apps yes. or for data apps. Yes. That was an early, early question that we kind of went back and forth on. And um, and yes, Smack, you know, Spark, Meso, Saka, Cassandra, Kafka, um, that was a that was the, the data apps, right? Yes. The people that were trying to do these really data things. Um, and I think that was uh, that was that was an area in which we were wildly successful. Mm -hmm. um, but I think because the people who were doing Smack were already kind of, they were already kind of greenfield. Mm -hmm. You know, they were, already, they were already kind of at that place in their, in their projects or careers or anything else to say, oh, you know, I want to do this thing where I've got this analytics that's running that's, uh, you know, storing data in a key value store, not a, you know, database, but a key value store. Yes that's using a message bus to doing a bunch of our processing, that's using actors to, you know, to serve all this stuff back out, out to the users. That was kind of already, you know, the people that were doing this actually were, were Greenfield. One of the areas we wanted to focus on in addition to that, which we obviously spent a bunch of time in that, but the other area that you mentioned that we thought we would get the massive scale from was all called the Brownfield, mm -hmm. the data center operators, um, the cluster operators who just had tons of apps that they wanted to run in far more efficient ways to drive up utilization, mm -hmm. um, and that was that was kind of this this other area. Now, in our case, um, you know, to help to get to the scale that we're at today, we honestly did both. We honestly put 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 time and effort in, into both of them. Mm -hmm. But I think that there very much was a strong interest that we had in uh, in you know getting the brownfield apps to run. I, I, I'll, I probably because that was what we lived through, right? Mm -hmm. we, you know, at the Twitters, we lived through really taking these more monolithic esque apps, tr transforming them, and 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 you know, helping everybody in in, in, in a big way. Um, but I, I, you know, I think that it was easier to talk to people about the data apps, the Smack stuff. Mm -hmm. than it was to talk to people about the, the brownfield. That was a big learning for mine o over the time. Mm -hmm. um, I think I was more expecting that we would just get massive scale quickly with the brownfields. And actually, we had to do a lot of work to get people to actually want to, to take that on. Why? Well, 
you know, sometimes when stuff just runs, people don't want to touch it, even if it's expensive. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it's like, well, it's just kind of working. It's doing its thing. Perhaps we shouldn't actually make any changes right now. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, even if you could save a bunch of money, you know, that uh, money talks sometimes, but sometimes it doesn't. People can't really sometimes put a value on the ease of not having to actually deal with stuff. Mm -hmm. To this day, I still think that there is a massive number, you know, of, of applications out there that if we put a little bit of effort into them could be moved to you know, platforms, resource management, container orchestration platforms that would save a tremendous amount of money and electricity uh, around the world. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but again, I also don't, I don't see that as much being the focus. I still see the focus in the container orchestration space being for a lot of the greenfield applications. And for container orchestration, less so for data apps and more and more for, um, uh, for, for these web apps that we were talking about earlier. I just read uh, on the way here that if you binge watch several episodes of Netflix, it's equivalent to driving four miles because you're wasting the cloud resources. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah so, so I think you're right. Like, if we go to cloud scale, this is actually more and more relevant. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, so I want to actually uh, explore one thing. Uh, so recently, uh, the, there is this uh, uh, new company created by Brian Kentrell, who is also a speaker at scale by the bay as, as you are, uh, called Oxide Computers. And so uh, they basically want to uh, develop uh, OEM data centers. So they want to just build data centers uh, with uh, the idea of running them properly. Yeah. Right? And so and using Rust uh, as, a, as a kind of layer to do this. And uh, I asked Brian kind of, you know, why not kind of put messages on this and so forth. And so I think the kind of my understanding is that uh, so as a software system, sitting on top of it, taking for granted the existing hardware architecture, mm -hmm. and DCOS was the offering, right? And so the question in my mind is, uh, you know, why, if we disrupt everything, we should disrupt the data center. We shouldn't take hardware as a given, mm -hmm. right? Because it was created by different people for different purposes. So totally. with these brownstone projects, mm -hmm. right? They just bought a bunch of stuff from best practices as they knew it, mm -hmm. the CDOs and CIOs, and, right? And so, in, so it's like in my mind, it sounds almost like we need to do through the hardware of a data center this primitive early Hadoop which is a bunch of primitive PCs, which were essentially built for a different era, and control plane slept on top of this. So that's, I think that Brian has a very kind of solid idea. So w what do you think about this? And kind of, did you see that you need to actually reach inside the hardware, inside of working around all the stuff with software and all these resources? Do you see kind of evolved into taking over the hardware and doing software hardware co-development? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really, really, it's a really interesting question. Um, I think, the re, the, from my experience, what, what I've learned is, at the end of the day, if your mental model is just, I've got some computation, and I want to run that computation somewhere, mm -hmm. um, I think what that's, wherever that somewhere is, it's going to have to have something to execute code, mm -hmm. a CPU, it's going to have to have something to store memory, you know, whether that's registers, a cache, mm -hmm. actual main memory, or a disk, right? So then that's the third one. It's going to have to have somewhere to, 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 to you know, to potentially store things even longer like a disk, but maybe not, maybe mm -hmm. not. I think at the very least it's got to have memory and some, some kind of way of processing it. So. Um, if that's kind of your mental model, then I 1,000% believe that there could be a future world where we're creating hardware, which is not like your standard form factor hardware where we just clustered a bunch of machines together to run Hadoop, because mm -hmm. um, that's what we had. I could very much see a future world in which there is hardware that is kind of purposely put together for running in particular kinds of way, whether it's because it's got accelerated FPGAs or it's got you know, other kinds of hardware adva advancements that certain software can take advantage of. Um, and then if those things kind of show up wherever, you know, from my perspective, I think you know, e everything's fair game. Mm -hmm. The things we're going to need to know from the software perspective is how far away are these things from one another mm -hmm. from a 
latency from a bandwidth perspective, so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. What are the failure relationships with respect to these things? If this one fails, is this thing also going to fail, so forth and so on? But I don't think it needs to be an x86 box, you know, mm -hmm. your standard box. I just think it needs to be some kind of resources that I know I can actually run some stuff on. I don't even think it needs an operating system. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? um, I don't think it needs, you know, you know, Linux or, you know, it, it'll probably be helpful if it's there, but I think it doesn't need that. What it really just needs is you just need the hardware, you need some software that's compiled to be able to take advantage of those resources on the machine, and then you just, you just want to run that. Um, so I, I do like the idea of, of you know, taking a step back and saying, hey, can we potentially you know, think a little bit differently about, about hardware, how hardware gets built? But I also think that um, we're really going to need some software to help with that. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's not just going to be hardware, it's going to be software. And I'm biased. I'm more of a software person than a hardware person. I think that if you did some really powerful things with software, you could get away with the current way that we're doing hardware for quite some time. Mm -hmm. I think you could actually, you know, just keep kind of doing hardware the way it's been doing for quite some time. Once you had more people doing software in this more abstract way, then I think you could start to do some interesting things with hardware. So, and uh, I mean, you almost described a very general way to look at things, and I think they kind of enclose the age as this is understood right now, right? Because if you have these little devices mm -hmm. and, you know, they have latency, uh, then, you know, they can be far and they can be weak. Uh, so how does age fit into your current thinking and this whole methods? Like the, the, a, the age of the, of the... The IoT framework, right? Yeah. Because DCOS implied the DC. Yeah. And so edge is now kind of... Edge, sorry, out sorry. Outside I just DC. misunderstood. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it, Edge to me is the perfect example. Like, that, that's the perfect example of, I think we're starting to push what the form factor of hardware looks like. Um, but still, when, when we're at the edge, it's, you know, when I'm writing software these days that runs on my, my laptop, I don't think of it as much as a laptop. Mm -hmm. The way I actually think about it is, I have four 2.1 gigahertz processors and this much memory. Mm -hmm. like, like, that's like more how I think about, you know, it's just, just pools of resources. Mm -hmm. The edge is just another, a bunch of these pools of resources. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, that's, I think, where I, where I would love to see us go as an industry is where we stop thinking about particular form factors of machines. We start thinking first and foremost just more about those resources. Mm -hmm. Just pools of resources, chunks of resources, and then we start to get programming models, which are more about programming of those pools of resources. You know, it doesn't matter if Amazon spun up the VM or Google mm -hmm. spun up the VM. Or who cares? Mm -hmm. What are the resources? Oh, I have a GPU there, and yes. I have an FPGA there. That's far more interesting to me than anything else. Oh, I've got a you know six gig NIC there and a two gig NIC there. You know, that's far more interesting. What can I actually you know do with those resources? You have some. I mean, you have some expectations of. There is so much bandwidth you can have, right? And I think what's interesting with the blockchain, which is a distributed system, I think there is now an expectation that something can just die and never come back and partition. So that, does your current paradigm break anywhere? For instance, you know, some, some people I heard actually advocate for the death of eventual consistency because the world is so complex. Yeah. You will never have the full view yeah. of the whole system. So, you know, like as humans, we have locality. And if, you know, a million people somewhere disagree, we don't care mostly. Right, and so sometimes you will never have eventual consistency because it's just too much, too much data. You will not never have the full view, yeah. and also because you have now the edge, some systems will never come back, mm -hmm. and some systems will be guaranteed to die. So, do you kind of do you think of this? How do you manage resources which may die and never come back? Totally. I mean, the concept of ephemeral ephemeral resources that I'll never get back is that. It's becoming a much more standard concept that we think about a lot. You know, spot instances on, on the cloud is a good example. Mm -hmm. And I think that that does have to be baked into when I'm describing those resources I was talking about, like a GPU or two gigabytes of something here, you need to understand, is that two gigabytes I get forever or is that two gigabytes that is ephemeral that might be, you know, might be taken away from me? Mm -hmm. And even forever is a pretty harsh word. There really no is forever. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> right, right. so, so e even there, you know, it's, it's forever is kind of like a forever, which is, you know, <laughs> as long as I can, but if I've got something really important there, I probably have some other entities in the system that's also doing the same thing. But yeah, I mean, 
if uh, if we you know if there's some catastrophic failures that cause us to lose many data centers simultaneously, does this idea of just running lots of software in a distributed way you know break down? It totally breaks down. But personally, I don't think that that scenario is any more likely than a scenario in which we just had a bunch of humans running around doing the, these computations you know, manually or something and remembering this information themselves. We, mm -hmm. would do, we would do the same thing if we wanted to not deal with failure. We'd store information in multiple people, humans at the same time. Yes. We'd have multiple humans do things redundantly and all that stuff. And document it. And document it. And there could be a redundant, you know, there could be a catastrophic failure where we lose all those humans too. So, you know, I, I, I don't think it's any, it's, it's any more likely. I, I think it's, it's just the reality of, of there can be failures and therefore you have to program for that. And, and yeah, I, I personally think that we could write software which lives and moves around across all these different resources for decades just keeps going, mm -hmm. you know? Just keeps moving around and... As we should, as we should. I think we should too, yeah. So I want to kind of uh, wrap up with the current age of uh, D2IQ and also the ascent of Kubernetes and coexistence. So, so it's very interesting to me uh, that you guys basically took the skill set you have with Mesos, right? And you know a bunch of, of about the service systems. Since every kind of, every few years, new bunch of people discover what other people knew, right? And so kind of it seems to me that Kubernetes ba folks basically found what Mesos folks knew, and you guys uh, are basically evolving by, by embracing it, right? And so now you're called D2IQ, not just Mesosphere, and you told me that you develop operators for, for Kubernetes. Can you talk a little bit how this kind of transpired and how, how like, when you look at yourselves, what, how did you kind of, quantify your scalable skills yeah. for these frameworks, and how do you kind of apply them to something which you know, came from the outside, like Kubernetes? Totally, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean as I mentioned earlier, um, one of the areas that we started to focus on pretty early uh, with Mesos was uh, stateful distributed systems. Mm -hmm. um, why? Because we felt they were the most complicated ones, and so we should make sure that we can run those ones if we ever want to be a place where you can run everything. Smack has a bunch of state. Yes. Uh, Cassandra and Kafka, at the very least, have. And they need collocation state. if you know the state is managed properly. You, it's you, you yeah, you can do a lot of really efficient things if you can manage the the the, the, the state properly. Um, so we did that a bunch in Mesos, and 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 that was kind of one of the areas in which we we were really successful in, in making it so you could run a bunch of these stateful things. So as Kubernetes started to get more and more popular. Um, I mean, to be perfectly honest, we just had a lot of people in the Kubernetes community that came to us and said, hey, can you bring a bunch of the stateful ideas that you had in the Mesos world to the Kubernetes world as well? Mm -hmm. um, one of the interesting things about the early days of Kubernetes was uh, people weren't even specifying the resource requirements um, for the machines. There wasn't actually a resource model of how many resources were being consumed or how many were getting allocated. You just launch your application and you like say one CPU, one gig of RAM, and then it mm -hmm. could just use whatever it wanted and it just ran. Um, and that's what I was talking about earlier, how there was just such a pent up demand for separating the machines from the people, you know, mm -hmm. the, you know the, the cattle and pets uh, uh, scenario, mm -hmm. that people didn't even care exactly how many resources were, were being consumed. So state and thinking about disks and stateful stuff was, was something that the Kubernetes community didn't get to as, as, um, you know, as, as quickly or spend as much time focusing on as we had in the Mesos community. And, and it was a natural place for us to step in and work with that community and doing stateful stuff. So what have we, what have we been building We've been building these things called operators. So in the Mesos world, um, if you wanted to write some code which managed other things that were running in the system, a great example being Kronos, which mm -hmm. we talked about earlier, which manage all these, all these uh, computations that are being run in this DAG, in, in this graph. Um, in Mesos, you built what was called a scheduler. Mm -hmm. Why? Because that thing, Kronos, was scheduling which part of the DAG should be, should be run in, in what, yes. what place. Um, and in, in Kubernetes, a pattern emerged, and it wasn't built in that into Kubernetes so you could do it this way, but a pattern emerged for doing something similar to this, 
called the operator pattern. Mm -hmm. um, I like the name operator pattern because it's kind of like instead of a human operator doing this, some code is actually going to do it instead. Um, it reminds us of an algebra of some sort, yeah, an operator. Yeah, we, we, we called it scheduler uh, because we Marathon were, and... Marathon's a and scheduler, Aurora. exactly, Aurora's a scheduler, Kronos a scheduler. We called it scheduler because we came from the academic community and that's exactly what was happening. We were scheduling different tasks and so we called it scheduler. Yes. Um, in hindsight, scheduler was a bad name because whenever somebody hears the word scheduler, they think they need a PhD to go build one of those things. And yes, or the thing of Uzi, do it. And things like that. Yeah, exactly, yes. Yeah. So people get really, really scared about this stuff. Um, operator, on the other hand, has less of a scary, scary name, but it's basically the same concept. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we, we've, we've been working in the Kubernetes community to build um, operators specifically around a bunch of, of uh, uh, stateful storage stuff. In some ways, we're kind of building the operator for operators. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, we're building a higher level uh, operator which lets you declaratively describe how it should manage all of its different components mm -hmm. um, versus in the, Mesos, Mesos, in the early Mesos days, when you were to build these schedulers, they were imperative. You, know, mm -hmm, you basically mm -hmm. wrote code to actually run them. Mm -hmm. And our years of experience have taught us that actually if we can, if we can enable people to capture all that, that in a declarative way, um, then they could you know, write less code. Um, from my perspective, I always like the idea of trying to do it declarative, and then if you can't, falling back and having a way of being able to write some imperative stuff to actually get whatever you're trying to accomplish done. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's the model that we've really been taking. Do you have a language, a DSL for declarative? It, it, yeah, so you're not going to like this, but it's in YAML. Okay, <laughs> that's the current stage. Um, it's, that's, the, that's the current state of the art that's, for what people yeah. are doing. Yeah, so that's yeah. effectively the DSL as, as you, you, you write YAML. Um, and, and the project, I forgot to mention, the project's called Kudo. Kudo, yes. Yeah, so it's the Kubernetes Universal Declarative Operator. So Universal Operator Operator Declarative, Declarative is what I mentioned, and, and Kubernetes Operator. So, so it's, it's interesting, interesting because it sounds like you're scaling the scale. It's a meta scale, right? Yeah, because yeah. you're scaling the engine, yeah. which scales then the jobs. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, yeah, that's very interesting to me because you know, we, we have limited time, so we didn't go into Marathon and Aurora, but I think that's also a very interesting kind of uh, direction of itself. So kind of, you know, I'd, I'd like to finish with uh, kind of, if we can look back, uh, right? Uh, so we touched on, upon Mesos, Spark, which started as a toy project and now grew into a multi-billion dollar company, which scaled a bunch of other things, yep. right? And Kubernetes, which scales a lot of things and has similar ideas. So I wonder if you can kind of uh, reminisce of this, you know, somehow the, all these projects became, like they scaled themselves. So, you know, Mesos is used at Apple and, and Uber and other, and Twitter and Kubernetes is, used in a bunch of places and Spark itself is, you know, took off, right? So what is it about the software projects, with their principles, what is it that made them scalable in the real world? Like, they, you know, they, they, they can scale companies mm -hmm. in different aspects of these companies, right? You guys are kind of more of operations side and Spark more of kind of data pipelines run on often sometimes on top of these other things. So what is it, like, if, if you would, you know, um, kind of had to distill it's an open-ended question, right? We don't know the answer. This whole series is about it, right? So, so I'm not looking for the full answer, but like, do you see, because you did a lot of work with Mesos and you saw the spark take off, what would be your kind of highlights of why these things took off a myriad other things died mm -hmm. and never saw the scale which, which these things enjoyed? Yeah, you know, I... I think if I had the uh, perfect answer for that, then I'd be able to just go churn out, you know, <laughs> tech and company yes. at one after another. Yes. Um, and I, I know that you, you, you know that, you know, there's probably not any, any one particular answer. But I'll give you my, you know, the things that I've seen over the years um, that at least I kind of look for in future, future projects. One is, um, is there a real need, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and and that, that need, interestingly enough, is often that people are trying to do something and you're gonna make it easier for them to do it. Mm -hmm. So we talked about Kronos before, where yes. some people were actually buying this product to do this product. And everybody that we chatted with had some kind of, you know, Frankenstein bash <laughs> scripts to do it themselves, right? Right, 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 right? So I think that's kind of, that's part number one. Mm -hmm. Is like is 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 there a real need that somebody has to to 
that can be solved by some piece of technology that, that can, can make it simpler. Um, when it comes to the technology actually taking off and, and scaling and maybe company scaling as well, because um, I, th I think you know, what's interesting is, as I say some of this, this out loud, in some ways, this is not the point of academic research, is mm -hmm. to figure out stuff that's going to take off and scale. Yes. The point, in some ways, of academic research is just to try to push the envelopes to create new ideas yes. to get people to think differently, you know, you know, do differently. But for projects that, in particular, you're trying to, to get to scale, I think you need that need. In Spark's case, uh, we had Hadoop, mm -hmm. but people were not happy with it. Yeah. You know? and Yes, there were advancements in Sparks in particular, leaving things in memory so that we could do different kinds of applications faster, mm -hmm. specifically things like linear regressions, which mm -hmm. were really critical for folks that were doing a lot of the machine learning. Um, so there was, there, was, you know, there was something there, just like in the Kronos case, there was something there, but it wasn't doing everything people really wanted to. Like in Kronos' case, there was, no, there was no DAG for what people had. There was like new functionality, they really wanted that. You know, if I would have known what I know now, I, we probably would have created the Kronos company. Mm, yes. <laughs> you know, because we probably could have just scaled that out massively. There was a need. People could have moved away from what they were currently using, gotten more functionality, and, and, and gone. But I, I think that's kind of the number one thing, is like you've got some tech, you've got a real need um, that people have, and they're, they're doing it in some way. You know, they've got bash scripts or they've got mm -hmm. some old product or something else that they can get. I some, think you could steal the cross company because everybody, yeah. <laughs> everybody still needs this, right, in a way. We probably could. We probably <laughs> could, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, that's probably my, 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 my biggest nugget of, of, of insight there. And so, you know, now, even today, when I see some new, new technology projects, you know, come out or some companies get created, that's often the question I ask myself is, well, how do people do it today? And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, what's the new value they get from, from doing this? And, and then how many people do I think are going to actually do that? And, um, and if, the number, you know, if there's enough of those people, then I think that that thing will actually scale. What's interesting, honestly, is that a lot of technology, you know, you've probably heard this quote as well, the best technology doesn't necessarily win. Um, but whatever technology wins becomes the best technology. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really interesting quote because more than once I've seen technology that didn't, you know, wasn't necessarily the best, couldn't, for example, scale necessarily. Mm -hmm. I think Kubernetes was a great example. Um, it had a hard time scaling to the scale that we could scale with Mesos. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, as more and more people were doing Kubernetes, the technology gets better and better and better, and eventually, you know, it, it you know it gets to the scale that it needs to actually actually uh, perform at, um, and that's a you know so, so I don't always you know I don't think the answer I guess to put it this way, when you look at like what, like whether or not a technology will go and become super successful, I don't necessarily it's how good the technology is. You know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I I don't think that's nearly as important because I think that any technology will will could get there if there's enough scale behind it in terms of a community and, and, and users and, and all those other people. Yes, yeah, so maybe in case of Kubernetes, point. Docker is very familiar to people, right? So maybe kind of the catch may be the, kind of in case of Spark, what I've seen is that the big data becomes super easy because you just, you just, first of all, it's all in memory. Yeah. And, and, and it's, you know, your expectations are fulfilled because I have a big collection, I say dot .map, and it's actually there. Yeah. I say dot .filter, it's there. Not reduce is there, right? So it's just what you expect. I think Docker is a very well expected because it's a, it's a it's a atavistic image of a machine, right? And so like uh, I think uh, at Twitter you guys use special packages for Aurora, right? So so once you have the full control, you actually nobody needs Docker. It's an, it's it's a regress, yeah. right? So but people think of this as their packages right. in a way, and then you write like I think this is very interesting. Uh, uh, what will be the and, and Docker scaled, and then you need to, to run them somehow, right? So, so, so I think that that may be one of this mm -hmm. in my mind. But uh, yeah, I think that something should scale. Maybe some mem some some understanding, human understanding of how this should be. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I mean, you guys did a great job. So it's really it's been really you know helpful. 
uh, to get this, and, and I don't think we even scratched a bunch of things. So mm -hmm. hopefully, you know, can we'll come back. Can, and can always have an yeah, chat. and uh, always happy to chat with you. Yeah, this project is always kind of is going to evolve uh, further. But thank you very much, Ben. We really appreciate your time and uh, wish you continued success with D2IQ. Great, thanks so much, Alex. Appreciate it.